This week we're here at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts to interview world-renowned linguist and philosopher Noam Chomsky. Someone who's authored over a hundred books on everything from war to propaganda, I wanted to get his take on democracy and elections within the context of American empire. As extreme as the political spectrum is right now in the U.S., uh, there's still almost complete uniformity on the war on terror, the stance toward Latin America, sanctions on Iran, and there's really no anti-war candidate, despite popular opinion agreeing on that. Why can no candidate touch that? The spectrum is broad, but in an odd sense. The spectrum is basically from center to extreme right, mm -hmm. extreme right, way off the spectrum. So the Republican Party about 20 years ago basically abandoned any pretense of being a normal political party. In fact, uh, uh, distinguished, respected conservative commentators from the American Enterprise Institute right-wing think tank uh, like Norman Ornstein described the Republican Party as a radical insurgency which has abandoned uh, parliamentary politics. Uh, they just don't want anything to happen. Their only policies are don't do anything or bomb. That's, uh, and that's not a political party. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the, what happened is that the party, uh, during the whole neoliberal period, both parties shifted to the right as everywhere in the world. And the Republicans just went off the spectrum. Uh, they became so dedicated to the uh, 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 the interests of the extreme wealthy and powerful that they couldn't get votes. So they had to turn to other constituencies which are there but were never politically mobilized. Uh, Christian evangelicals, uh, nativists who are afraid they're taking our country away from us, uh, people who are so terrified that they have to carry a gun into a coffee shop, and uh, that's their base, essentially. And uh, when, you, when you look at what, just take a look at the primaries, I mean, any candidate who has a semblance of rationality is not even competing. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so that's the Republicans. The Democrats have shifted to the right as well. The, uh, today's Demo mainstream Democrats are pretty much what used to be called moderate Republicans. Somebody like uh, Eisenhower, for example, would be considered way out on the left. Uh, so, for example, Eisenhower uh, uh, strongly uh, made it very clear, as he put it, that anyone who questions the programs of the New Deal is just not part of American political life. Well, by now, that's a left-wing program. It's basically Bernie Sanders' program. Yeah. That's uh, Eisenhower. So the, the spectrum just is, it's true that it's broad, but in a very strange sense. <clears throat> as far as uh, anti-war candidates are concerned, you have to ask what it means. So for example, Obama is considered an anti-war candidate. Uh, he uh, described the Iraq war as a mistake, a strategic blunder, as he put it. I mean, that's like uh, Russian generals in um, Afghanistan in the early 1980s who uh, criticized the invasion as a strategic blunder. That's not criticism of the war, it's saying you're making a mistake. Uh, the debate about the uh, Obamas is running a global terror program of a kind that has never been envisioned before the drone program. It's now being discussed to an extent because of recent leaks, but uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the questions that are being raised overwhelmingly, I mean, not, not by Jeremy Scale and Glenn Greenwald, but by most of those who are talking about it, is uh, are you killing too many civilians? Uh, what about just assassinating people because you think someday they might want to harm you. I mean, suppose, for example, that Iran was murdering uh, people in the United States uh, because they think, with some reason, that they might want to harm them. For example, the editors of the New York Times and the Washington Post, who publish articles, op-eds, uh, calling for bombing of Iran. So suppose they said, well, this is an imminent threat, let's kill them. Uh, would we accept that? 
uh, these, uh, the idea that we have the right to use force and violence at will is accepted pretty much across the spectrum. Now take, say, the uh, Iran negotiations. Virtually everyone, president, uh, political leaders, uh, commentators in the press, uh, dovish commentators, almost universally say that if we unilaterally detect, think we detect some Iranian violation of the agreements, then we have a right to use military force to attack them. I mean, that's just outlandish in terms of international law and practice, but it's universal, virtually universal. You have to go way to the margins to find somebody who will question that. And there's not even a mild critique of the assassination program or even the war on terror, the premise. Um, from any of these candidates. And every four years, we're made to feel like we're playing this great role, this great democratic practice, you know, in, in decision making, where we celebrate electing these leaders who rule over us. I mean, how does power really function in our society? But there's very good studies of this from uh, <clears throat> mainstream political science, not nothing on the edges. So one of the main topics that studied in academic political science is uh, the relation between people's attitudes and public policy. And it's a pretty straightforward s study. You see public policy, uh, there's very good polling evidence on what people think about things. So for example, for about uh, 40 years, a uh, considerable majority of the public has thought that taxes should go up on the rich taxes go down on the rich. Uh, a substantial part of the public, often a big majority, thinks that we ought to have a national health care program. Nothing impossible. In fact, when the press discusses this, they call it politically impossible, meaning the pharmaceutical companies won't accept it, the insurance companies won't accept it, and so on. So it basically doesn't matter what the public thinks. Uh, about 70% uh, of the public, <clears throat> lowest 70% on the income scale, are pretty much disenfranchised. Uh, their attitudes have no detectable influence on the policies of their own representatives. As you move up the scale, you get a bit more influence. Uh, when you get to the top, policies made. And the top can mean a fraction of 1%. So it's kind of a plutocracy with democratic forms. And the elections, uh, um, I mean, by now it's almost become a joke, but it's always been true that uh, campaign financing is very, plays a very substantial role in not only who's elected, but what the uh, policies are. Now, that goes back uh, 100 years, a uh, great uh, campaign manager and 100 years ago, Mark Hanna, uh, was asked once, uh, what are the important things uh, that you have to have to find it to run a campaign? He said, there are three things. First one's money. The second one's money. <laughs> then I, f I forget what the third one is. You know? And pretty much that's true. It's be with the current reactionary Supreme Court, it's just gone out of sight. Uh, campaign spending is, you know, the billions and billions of dollars. People have argued it's just because of too much government interference. We need to widen the market. We need capitalism to be more free. I mean, you've argued that in any scenario of capitalism working, it's incongruous, it's incompatible with democracy. There was recently an IMF study, International Monetary Fund, study of the profits of the big banks in the United States. The financial sector has become enormous during the neoliberal period. It's you know, almost half the profit of corporate profit. Now, where does their profit come from? Turns out it comes from the taxpayer. 
uh, through the largely through the uh, there's an implicit government guarantee against failure. It's not state. It's not in law, but it's understood that if a major financial institution gets into trouble, the government will bail it out, which happens repeatedly. Only during the neoliberal period, incidentally, there were no major failures uh, during the 50s and the 60s uh, when the neoliberal policies began to be instituted, deregulation and so on. Then you start getting a series of financial crises. And every time the public bails them out, well, that has consequences. For one thing, it means that the credit agencies understand that these are that the the uh, these corporations are high valued beyond the level of what they actually do because they're going to be bailed out. So they get good credit ratings. It means they can get cheap credit. They can get cheap loans from the government. Uh, they can, of course, they get the bailouts. They can. Uh, undertake risky transactions, which are profitable, because if it goes wrong, taxpayer will take care of it. Net result is that that amounts to practically all their, all their profits. Is that capitalism? Uh, energy, the, uh, the, there was another IMF study of government subsidies to energy corporations around the world, not just the US. Uh, they estimated about, uh, I think, $5 trillion a year which includes the U.S., of course, plenty of subsidies, uh, agribusiness is subsidies. But isn't that what the whole new libertarian movement would tell you is that precisely again, the government is being used as an extension of the market to protect this kind of like irregular form of capitalism that's hand in glove with the government, and we just need to kind of free up government regulation and let capitalism work on its own? First of all, the business world would never tolerate that. Uh, they rely heavily on government. But if you did follow the libertarian prescript, what are called libert remember what's called yeah. libertarian in the United States is has nothing to do with traditional libertarianism. It's a kind of ultra right capitalist uh, anarcho capitalism they call it. If that was allowed to function, the whole society'd collapse and we turn to total tyranny. We would have tyranny of unaccountable private institutions. A private concentration of capital is totally unaccountable to the public. It's absolute tyranny. Uh, the only thing that protects the public from predatory capitalism is some degree of state intervention. So it's true that the state intervention uh, does support the capitalist institutions. It also protects the society from total destruction. A predatory capitalist system just it simply couldn't survive. I mean, for example, I mean, for perfectly obvious reasons. For one thing, it wouldn't care about externalities, it effects on others. Uh, so within no time, it would destroy the environment simply by uh, uh, destroying resources, uh, pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, who cares? Uh, furthermore, there would be no public goods. Uh, 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 the markets, I mean, there's an ideology that, which claims that markets provide freedom of choice, so they're kind of democratic. That's not true, and we all know it's not true. So, for example, suppose I, I want to get home this evening. Uh, the market does offer choices, a uh, Ford or a Toyota. It doesn't offer the choice I want, which is a public transportation system. That's not part of the market. Uh, the market focuses you on individual consumption of consumer goods, period. Now that's, is that what you want in life? Just more and more gadgets around? Um, there are lots of other things in life which the market doesn't even offer. So what's called libertarianism is a prescription for complete disaster. I'm not, I don't think the people advocating it understand this. I'm not criticizing them, but uh, just think it through. Mm -hmm. And I should say it's very anti-libertarian. I mean, traditional libertarianism, which was always on the left, was opposed to the master-servant relation, people giving orders and other people taking them. That's libertarianism, and not in th this version. A few weeks ago, the U.S. military um, intentionally 
bombed a hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan. I mean, the U.S. government felt it enough to just apologize. And there's people leaping to the defense of the establishment here, saying there must have been a good reason. Either they did it on accident, even though that we know that they didn't, or, um, you know, there was Taliban hiding in there, and so it justified, obviously, this human shield logic, just like Israel does. I mean, how does this specific example illustrate how American exceptionalism functions? Well, we have to be careful about the term American exceptionalism. And for one thing, it's not at all exceptional. Mm -hmm. Every imperial power has behaved the same way, uh, sometimes worse. So it's just normal imperial practice. It's called exceptionalism, but nothing about that. Of course, it's called, it's supposed to be exceptional in that uh, we have the highest ideals. So maybe we make mistakes, but it's always with the highest ideals. That's American exceptionalism. Except that, too, is true of every, just about every imperial power. So when the British were um, destroying the world, uh, they were always doing it with the absolutely highest ideals, the leading figures, leading intellectuals. Uh, people like John Stuart Mill, estimable people, were describing England as an angelic country beyond anything that anyone's ever imagined. Uh, people can't understand how marvelous we are and so on. Uh, the French were the same. It's uh, hard to find an exception. So there's no exceptionalism. The uh, 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 in the case of the Kunduz Hospital, apparently, I mean, I don't think all the details have come out, but it seems that they were trying to kill uh, some people they regarded as Taliban leaders or activists. And they happened to be in the hospital, so they killed everybody. And there's a lot of there is a lot of criticism of killing the others. What about killing the person they were targeting? I mean, what right do we have to kill somebody in some other country who we don't like. them either, you know, don't like the Taliban at all. But does that mean we have a right to go kill them? I mean, do they have a right to go kill us if they don't like us? That's not questioned at all. What's questioned is, and criticized, is attacking a hospital and uh, killing the staff and killing the patients. And, you know, it's not the first time. So, for example, when the, uh, when the U.S., one of the uh, lauded achievements of the U.S. Army in uh, Iraq is the conquest of Fallujah in November 2004. Now, take a look at it. Just take a look at the New York Times, the days of the attack on Fallujah. The first day of the attack, there's a picture on the front page, you can practically visualize it, uh, which is a picture of the General Hospital in Fallujah. Marines attacked the general hospital, uh, threw the patients off their beds, put them on the floor, put shackles around them, threw the doctors on the floor. Uh, went, uh, attacking a hospital is a gross violation of international law. But they were asked, and they were asked, why did you attack it? They said because it was a propaganda agency for the rebels. How was it a propaganda agency? It was releasing casualty figures. Uh, and that was okay. That's an achievement. But even beyond that, what were the Marines doing in Fallujah? I mean, are there uh, Iranian Marines in, the, uh, in Cambridge? What are U.S. Marines doing in Iraq? Uh, the invasion of Iraq is uh, the worst crime of this century. It's had horrible effects, but uh, it's now you know, it spawned uh, sectarian conflicts that are tearing the region apart. But suppose it had worked. I suppose it had pacified Iraq and uh, there was no disasters. It's still a major crime. Uh, why do we have the right to invade another country? And in fact, if you look back, there's, there's another crime which is never discussed. In the 1990s, the sanctions on Iraq were so severe that they 
virtually destroyed the society. In fact, the, the sanctions were administered by the United Nations and the, uh, the international diplomats who administered the sanctions were respected international diplomats. Uh, Dennis Halliday, Hans von Sponek, they both resigned in protest on the grounds that the sanctions were genocidal. Mm -hmm. Their term, not mine. They said the sanctions are genocidal, they're destroying the society, they're strengthening the dictator, they're forcing the population to rely on him for survival, and probably they saved him from being overthrown from within, as happened to one after another, a dictator of the same sort. That was the 1990s. Uh, that's considered no problem. You know, that was liberal Democrats. Uh, well, I mean, by the time that Bush and Blair decided to invade Iraq, the society was half devastated. Mm -hmm. So you hit a very fragile system with a sledgehammer, you're going to have horrible results. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the very idea of invading is criminal. And try to find someone who describes it as a crime. Right. Um, Obama is praised because he describes it as a mistake. Does he describe it as a crime? Does anyone? Um, except way out at the fringes. It was the dumb war, right? And dumb war. Yeah, we dumb shouldn't war. do dumb things. We do smart yeah, things. Yeah, we do smart wars. That's well, like uh, German generals after Stalingrad who says it's really stupid to have a two-front war. We should have destroyed England first. Well, I always think it's interesting that people use the rationale that we didn't find WMDs as if that would have been a rationale to invade and occupy a country, finding weapons of mass destruction. I mean, of it's insane. Not. And in fact... It's completely insane. You know, if, they want, if they're concerned about weapons of mass destruction, there are ways to proceed. The UN inspectors are doing a fine job. Actually, the same, pretty much the same, similar questions arise in the case of the Iran nuclear deal. So Iran, according to the United States, uh, poses a grave threat to the world. That's pretty much an American and Israeli obsession. And most of the world doesn't see it that way. Uh, but um, say, let's say it's a threat. Suppose Iran poses a threat. How do you, are there simple ways of uh, dealing with this? In fact, there are. And in fact, very popular ones. Uh, the best way to deal with it would be to work towards uh, instituting a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. That's supported by almost the entire world. It's strongly supported by Iran. In fact, they're one of the leading advocates of it. Yeah, when you're not even acknowledging that Israel has them, then how That's can the you... problem. The U.S. won't permit it because it does not want Israeli nuclear weapons to be open to inspection. So therefore, we block the obvious way to deal with whatever problem there is. And it is supported by virtually the entire world. Comes up every five years at the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. And in fact, the continuation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty is actually contingent on doing this. That was agreed 20 years ago. That's the most important arms control treaty there is. Mm -hmm. If that treaty collapses, we're gone. Everybody will have nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and be using them. But the U.S. is so committed to protecting Israel's nuclear weapons that it's willing to uh, endanger the non-proliferation treaty and prevent the obvious means from uh, keeping nuclear weapons away from Iran in case they have any interest in developing them. Do you see a word of discussion of this outside of the arms control literature? And, you know, I write articles, but uh, way out of the fringes. Nothing that could possibly make the uh, uh, mainstream. There's this huge amount of grassroots energy donations um, around getting people elected who are believed to be able to give us solutions to the problems that we face now. Um, what do you think focusing our energy on? Take, say, the Bernie Sanders campaign which I think is important, impressive. He's doing good and courageous things. He's organizing a lot of people. That campaign ought to be directed to sustaining a popular movement which will use the election as a kind of an incentive, but then go on. And unfortunately, it's not. 
when the election's over, the movement's going to die. And that's a serious error. Um, the only thing that's going to ever, ever bring about any meaningful change is ongoing, dedicated, popular movements which don't pay attention to the election cycle. It's an extravaganza every four years. You have to be involved in it, so fine. We'll be involved in it, but then we go on. Uh, if that were done, you could get major changes.